everybody, and welcome to Happy Hour with Maestro Tim. I'm your host, the said Maestro Tim, and tonight I have a great uh, guest with me. He's a good friend of mine. I don't know how exactly to describe him. He's an actor. He's a comedian. He's a performance artist. He's a con he's a contortionist. He's a well. He's a Tomas Kubinek. Hello, Tomas Kubinek. How are you? Hi, Tim. Were you were you just reading that? Because your head was like this. You're... Oh, oh, actually, what you can't see is that um, we, what we're putting out to people on Facebook, we have another studio cam. So oh. we have a whole bunch of different camera angles. So we're going to actually make this production uh, production kind of like more like professional rather than just okay. sort of just you and me. Yeah. So you look better than you're appearing right now. Oh, I do. I do. Because his camera actually makes me drop about 40 pounds. Yeah, it's a great. Well, and he also puts on the on the screen that sort of filter that you know sort of takes about twenty, thirty years off of my life. You know, yeah, so they, yeah, it's good times, good times. <laughs> so Tomasz Kubinek, if that is your real name, yes. Uh, so um, what are we drinking today? Well, I have a. I'm surrounded by stuff. I, um, but I, I thought I, you know, in respect of my Czech heritage, this is the. Pilsner Urkel, the original Pilsner, mm -hmm. and I thought we could make okay. a toast off the top. Okay. To uh, Hancher Auditorium, who brought us together, and sure. Chuck Swanson in particular. Yeah, I think he should be watching right now. So, Chuck, if you're yeah. watching, make sure you uh, say hello on our chat room. So, uh, oh, by the way, before we drink, I've, I've got a complaint about my area because mm -hmm. when I when you told me that you were going to drink some Pilsner Urkel, mm -hmm. um, I went all around town trying to find a classic Pils. Do you think I could find it? So we in Iowa, we pride ourselves on being Czech. And do you think I could find a Czech pills? No, no. Yeah, I go to I go to some of these uh, microbreweries, and they say, "Well, try our IPA or our porter or this or that." And I say, "I'd, I'd like a pills, please." And I get deer in the headlights. So what? I, the best I could find was something called a New Zealand style pilsner. All right, and I've never had one. Until I actually sampled it before you came on, and I got to tell you, I think it's I think it's Latin for lousy beer. So uh, to you, sir, you drinking too. the real stuff. Thanks for being on here. It was good to see you after all these years. Cheers. You too, Jim. Mm -mm -mm. And and uh, cheers, Chuck Swanson. And Chuck to you. And cheers. Graham and Orchestra Chuck, Iowa. And to Orchestra, Chuck's going to be my guest in a couple of weeks, so he's actually studying up now. Because he knows the bar is set so high with you and me. Oh. He's I'll try to, to make study, it really study lousy hard. so it's a bit easier for him. Yeah, that's right. Because I don't want to bore our audience. But I mean, no pressure, Chuck, but you better be funny. Okay, okay so start studying up now. Okay? Right. So um, as we're speaking, by the way, you want, you're not going to see this, Tomas, but Ed is going to put up a lot of photos from some of the projects that we did All right. uh, in, in, in concert. So people will kind of know the sort of collaborations that, that you and I have done over the years. Uh, yeah. Let's just talk about what everybody has been talking about this year, yeah. and that, of course, is the pandemic. You yeah. are a one-man band in many ways. I yeah. admire that about you. Uh, so as a performer, a uh, very self-reliant performer, how has this hit you this this year? Well, um, it's, it's a lovely year, but it's pretty empty, you know? Mm -hmm. There's no work. I, mm -hmm. I stopped working in March. Everything was canceled. Right. And it looks like it will be canceled for quite a while yet until groups can gather. Um, I've done a few kind of creative things for free, mm -hmm. for fun. So I, I hosted my friend's wedding. We did a wedding out in the forest with like family members seated along a hillside. First of all, weddings aren't free and sometimes they're not fun either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pray. Continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was it was a magical wedding. I'll send you a clip of it later. It's it's. I cry every time I see the clip. It was um, two dear friends of mine that live near me here, and um, I'm actually the godfather to their dog. So we have a little group. There's seven of us. So we're we're keeping like a family of COVID safe people, and we cook together and we're fixing their house and take care of the dog and stuff. And there's going to be a baby coming, so um, we're going to do everything like that just to keep sane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I did a show behind my friend's barn, also a freebie, but um, we he has a bunch of antique wooden theater seats, and we spread them out in groups of three across, like we measured them six feet apart, and we we sent out a like an invite to make it like a private party, 
and it sold out right away. And then we added another 20 seats and extended it. And, and people were so happy to see, we did a show, you know, there are four of us who did a show with um, slapstick and music and it right. was like the highlight of their summer. People just wouldn't shut up about it. Well, I mean, people are starved for, for this kind yeah. of stuff. So is it, you said that there's no work and there isn't. Are you caught in the netherworld between cancellations and rescheduling? I mean, uh, but, you know, when, when the hammer came down in March, I mean, boom, everything stopped. Yeah, and we've gone, including here at Orchestra Iowa, we were, you know, thinking, well, what can we do to postpone and then reschedule, and then how much of it is go going to be new work? Uh, what does that mean for you on the other end of these things? Um, well, I'm for myself. I I'm not in any, any hurry to rush it because I I want I don't want to encourage people gathering in an unsafe way. Yeah, uh, and I don't want to travel on airplanes till things are figured out. Um, so it's, everything's kind of in limbo. Um, and the news I get is just, you know, nobody really knows The all the administrators kind of, um, are trying to figure it out, sure. but yeah. It, yeah. it's, could all change. Right. 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 Depending on how right. things are, right. you know, we, you know, this barn that you were in, is this the place, uh, that you were, um, developing new material. Uh, I don't want to yeah, give it too so, much of it away, but you were told yeah, me yeah. years back that you, there's this barn that you were practicing this new routine of yours. Yeah. And is this, the, is this the place? Yeah. So it's my friend's barn in Vermont. And um, whenever he's gone away on tour, uh, I, I watched his dogs, him and his girlfriend's dogs, and I rehearsed in the barn. Mm -hmm. So we did this show outside in the back, uh, big field with all the Vermont mountains in the background. And uh, actually, about maybe 10 years ago, he had a, a septic failure. So they, they had to dig That's this. That's the name of your next show. <laughs> yeah. well, Don't watch Gubinek in Septic Failure. I yeah, love yeah. It. I've got these ideas, man. I'm a genius. Stick with me. You're kid. good. I'm going I'm gonna <laughs> to write that one first. down. Yeah. <laughs> And then we actually, so so I don't know if you know about septics, but sometimes they have to do a, a field that's raised, right, for for the sewage to drain through. So we actually performed on this raised patch of grass. It's a natural stage, right? Maybe thirty by forty feet, and um, we told the audience about it. <laughs> but it was it cost him like thirty grand when he had to have it done. So, so which, finally, so who was on top of the poop? Was it you or the audience? <laughs> oh, we were. Okay, As just making be. sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually just the wastewater, you know. It does the leach through a leach field. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but um, anyway, so now it's it's doubling up as a stage and. Um, yeah, but this is also your way of working out through new material. I think a lot of other, um, a lot of other interviews I've been telling, I've, I've been hammering home this one basic point to audiences, and that when they get to a performance, they're seeing the final sliver in a very long process, and they can, yeah. tend to take it for granted that oh, okay, that that was great. Uh, now what's next? What, what's new now? Uh, and some of the things that you do in, as part of your performances, you know, have taken years of development. I don't think I'm giving anything away because most of the people who are tuned in right now have seen your show where you have this really dramatic thing where you play the ukulele, you, you basically put a glass of wine on your head. And by the way, at your advanced age... Yeah. <laughs> is, is, is it, can you still do that? Because I've noticed that with this person this year, my tummy has gotten wider, and when I bend over, my feet have gotten farther away from my hands. So mm. uh, to stay limber enough to do that sort of slow motion somersault. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I'm totally good. I think I'm going to be good till about 100. Oh, you make me sick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> are you, what are you doing, Tim? Are you doing any exercising? Or are you oh, why would I do diet? that? Oh, my God. The, the heresy, <laughs> the blasphemy. Why would I exercise? I don't want to ruin a perfectly good thing right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember um, when I first met you, you were a little more portly. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and, and you uh, were younger. And, like always elegant, but I remember I didn't see you for half a year, and then you were really slim. Yes, and you said you had just uh, changed your uh, life a bit, right? I did. I did. Well, yeah. what I found was interesting when I dropped all that weight, um, uh, my center of gravity changed, and actually it it wrecked my hips. Um, it was weird. Um, yeah. So, but 
It is what so it is. Did you have to uh, stand differently to conduct? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just odd, just because because your body mm-hmm. has to make these adjustments, and I, yeah. I didn't lose the weight for long enough to actually fix those adjustments. <laughs> You got a you got a little taste of it. I got a little taste of it, baby. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I uh so the first time Chuck suggested you, which yeah. was a, a stroke of genius that I got to meet you and work with you. Um I looked you up on the web mm-hmm. and I saw some footage of you conducting a, a non professional orchestra and it was just uh camera on you. Oh, okay. And I was really impressed with how how uh, live and nimble and playful you were. Oh, and uh, I, I've, sent I've it since to a, fixed a, that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have now stamped all the joy out of music making. Mission accomplished. <laughs> for you. Uh, I think it's the younger one. That's very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I sent the clip to an old girlfriend who knew that I was working on this project. Time out. Said, yeah, she I, hot? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. I said, what do you, you, you think? <laughs> I said, what do you think? And she said, Tim's your man. Ah. Yeah, and she was right, and so was Chuck. And uh, I, I feel so blessed that we got to work together and that we have this ongoing friendship. Well, it's great because every time you come through town, um, you know, whether I want to or not, I end up meeting with you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with, and with your wife, Jill. <laughs> We go to our favorite haunt. By the way, um, I'm sure there's a guy by the name of Mike Foch uh, who's uh, watching right now. Yeah. And, I, and I opened my re- remarks by saying Tomasz Kubinek, if that is your real name. Because, yeah. you know, somewhere in the dark corners of my sick mind, I kind of think you're actually really from Alabama and you're just faking the accent. So why don't you say something mildly insulting to me in Czech and we'll have Mike uh, translated in the chat room later. So. Well, damn, Tim, you just stumped <laughs> <you just laughs> me. You blew my cover, boy. I was in the witness protection program. Uh, don't spit. Please don't spit. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's something that I, I want you to try. This okay. is a Czech tongue twister. You Actually, you really want me to try something? Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll do uh, it first. Okay. And then you'll repeat it, okay? Okay. We'll go through it together, but okay. I have to make sure. I... Okay. <laughs> Here we go. So this contains one of the hardest sounds. The Guinness Book of Records has the sound r, which is an r with a little g above it. Okay. R. 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 That's it. R. Some Czech people can't even say it. Great. I'm on. I, I'm okay. Czech. You what? have a little bit of Czech um, background, Ukrainian background. And Ukrainian. Right? I'm just far, a little farther east than you. Yep. Yeah. And I, didn't you have your um, DNA done and you were from the Czech area? Yes. Now, that was weird. So my, for those who are watching, my wife is really into uh, genealogy. And uh, we, subs- pardon me, we, we subscribe to um, Ancestry, Ancestry.com. And we did the whole DNA thing. Yeah. And my grandfather is uh, from this Czech village called Chernovtsi. It's, it's, on, the, it's uh, on the border with uh, Romania. But it also shows where bubbles of where your DNA comes from. And sure enough, Chernatsi uh, had a small bubble of my DNA, so it made the, the family lore right. But then I looked around, and there's like these huge bubbles everywhere in eastern, well, it's, I guess, uh, Slovakia now, in Košice. And um, who knew? I was, so, I mean, there's a whole, you know, you and I could be, you know, both of us could be could, could have maybe uh, lost a branch in our tree. You know, we could be yeah. related. You know. Yeah, yeah. So there okay, you go. so are you ready now? Oh, okay. I hope I was trying to distract you from that. Okay, <laughs> okay. here we go. I'll do it first. Okay. I hope I don't choke. Three thousand three hundred thirty-three stříbrných stříteček stříkalo přes three thousand three hundred thirty-three stříbrných střech. Střech. Great. <laughs> and, and what that means is it means 3,333 silver spigots shot against across 3,333 silver rooftops. Beautiful. Yeah. And here I thought you were talking about Chichen Itza in Mexico. You know, just be, that's just because that's how my ear and my mind works. You know, it doesn't. <laughs> right. So, him. Yeah, I thought this could be kind of like a two-way interview. Okay. I remember one of the last times we met, you had like Maestro Tim's 
secrets to success. First one was answer your phone. Yep. Second one was decide yes or no. Yes. Show up on time. Correct. Be a good colleague. Yeah. And then I forget what the other one was. Uh, actually, be a good colleague is the last one. Um, be per- so, yeah, uh, pick up the phone, say yes or no, and commit. <laughs> um, show up. Be right. prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. And then be a good colleague. And if you can master all those five, all those five principles, you're going to find more work in whatever whatever field that you're in than, than yeah. anybody else. I think you could expand this into like a three day workshop and a book <laughs> and an audio cassette, you know, or CD. You know, you always were the businessman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. Well, it could be like a whole Jordan Peterson thing, right? Ah, I think so. And hey, look, I can even just, I can get Ed to put the, give me a microphone so I look like one of those uh, corporate speakers too. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, and, and each each one of those would have its full big chapter. Like going oh, into good God, chapter. yeah. It's not just God, simple. Yeah. Yeah. You don't just answer the phone. Hell no. Hell what no. What kind of phone do you have? That, Where is it? That's right. And if you buy now, we'll give you a whole new set of Ginsu knives and right. maybe you will actually join the second level of the Illuminati. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man, I love how you think. Hey, hold there. I'm going to go into the chat room to see if anybody's actually watching and see what they're All saying right. behind our maybe backs. Maybe not. So, uh, Chuck is watching. Oh. Yeah, uh, Tomas, uh, Chuck says Tomas would make the best out of any situation. Um, too right. And, of course, Mike, Mike Foch. Um, now, how did you like that for Czech? Let's see here. Um, uh, Pat, Pat Hazel, Pat, uh, she oh, yeah, says, Pat. yeah, Tom, Tomas, you are technically a dog father. I love that. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> that's what I am. Oh, Barbara Taylor. If I'd not seen you earlier, she said Pilsner Urquell is available in Edge, Edgewood Hy-Vee. That would explain it. I was in the wrong Hy-Vee, but I thought you're not allowed to uh, advertise any products. Now you bring that up, yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's not like I would say like Budweiser or something like that. <laughs> so Barbara Taylor, Pilsner uh, Randy Reynolds is uh, drinking a Jim Gimlet with tonic. Out, outstanding. Uh, you know, John John Noyd said, "Did I try Ben's?" Um, I must confess, I didn't. I was just a little lazy. I did all my shopping at one place, and I wanted it now and then. Jeanette Welch, good to see you, love. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, anything else going on? Uh, Marion Weiss. Uh, there's also uh, High V off of Wilson. Um, let's see here. I think that's pretty much all I have here. Oh, uh, Pat's asking me what question might I ask you to get uh, get you to give a shout out. Um, so Tomash, give Pat a shout out. Hey, Pat. <laughs> Pat. You know, you know, as the wise Pat once said to me. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, she said, um, "What are you working on these days?" And actually, let's go full circle. Let's go back to let's go back to that um, that barn. Yeah. Uh, are you using this year to perfect some of your new material? Because going back to the, to that slow motion somersault where you're whistling and playing the ukulele and doing yeah. all sorts of great things. I mean that that didn't happen overnight, and certainly not yeah. in a you know in a way that you can do that with ninety nine percent security. So what are you doing now to prepare, you know, for something to do in, in live performance? Because it's one thing to practice something. I always mm-hmm. say that, um, that uh, amateurs will practice something until they get it right, but, perform- but professionals will practice something until they won't get it wrong. And yeah. that is a magnitude of a million times more. So um, yeah. tell us some of the stuff that you're working on and how you're developing yeah. it. Well, actually, I'm... Um... I'm more kind of like just living pretty humbly and simply and mm-hmm. um, quite separate from showbiz. And I, I actually, I just integrate my, uh, my shtick into it, relating with my friends. I'm performing all the time with them. These, these few friends I see, you know, I'm always making jokes and right. goofing around and doing funny voices. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's actually not bad to have a big break from all of this mm-hmm. and not have the, um, the expectation that that's who you are. So you have to be that. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think I'm I'm kind of observing life differently, and I think hopefully it'll make me a deeper, better person and 
through that will be funnier anyway and more so these so called these so called friends that you are referring to um, yes these these people what what sort of are they are they performers like yourself are they comedians I mean um, um, because I'm assuming a lot of the interaction that you have is improvisatory which is both great for the moment and also perhaps inspirational for uh, longer things that you're developing perhaps yeah um, they're all kind of artsy types, you know, not uh, not necessarily all like full time performers or anything, though mm-hmm. a lot of my friends are. Hey, I wanted to show this tea, this teapot here. Oh, the first tour I ever did for Hancher, Chuck and Judy bought me this at the very end. Anyway, <laughs> oh, here's something, Jim. okay, here's something I've been thinking about how so a lot of people, uh, you know, we're trying these uh, video performances and stuff, right? Which I'm not really into it. Right. Like, I think it's nice because we're interacting right now. So sure. there's a connection. But the whole thing I'm alive for in my performing is to, to be there with the people and um, feel them and feel right. me, right? So I've, I've been thinking of things of how can you connect over a video screen and still make it, you know, you know, I'm flat, you're flat, we're right. in the yeah. box. So one of the things was like um, physical contact by proxy. So I go, Tim, this is your little head, buddy. I just love you. I love you. I'm going to just, I'm going to snap your little neck. <laughs> Thank <Love> you. you. <laughs> you know, some, you know, some other cultures would call that a voodoo doll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, but did you feel did you feel that affection? I, I did. My neck is sore. <laughs> Here's another one I'm gonna do. So this is like um sharing gifts by proxy. So hey Tim, buddy. I uh I got you like a really good chocolate bar. I know how you love chocolate. Well, thank you. Yum. And I know you can't be here and we we can't share it together, so I'm gonna I'm gonna eat it on your behalf. Um, yeah so oh my god this is it's an expensive really good dark chocolate one so i don't oh, suppose my, uh, my mouth is watering yeah thank you um yeah. i don't suppose you'll like send like a half-eaten chocolate bar in the mail to me will you oh my god too much so good <laughs> oh my god you're really missing out i just wish you could be here <laughs> Oh no! 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 Smile with your chocolate teeth now. Come on, let's see. Let's see those teeth. <laughs> is, is your mouth watering? Am I making your mouth water? Uh, no, but you're making me laugh like hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, that's kind of what I'm thinking of right now. Okay. But I I remain really optimistic and hopeful. I know that this COVID thing will blow over. It might take another year or something till we can all gather mm-hmm. in close proximity. But hopefully, I think it just makes us all um, better and dearer and we right. figure out life in a new way, you know? Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, you said, um, you, you said something about taking this time to be a uh, better human. Um, and, and also, there's nothing wrong with recharging your energies and recalibrating what you do as an artist. I know I've, in the dark of night, I've also thought about uh, the future of orchestras and how we program and how we perform and, and, and the like. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of, what a lot of people don't understand about live performance is that chemistry, there is, a, there is a psychic electricity between audience and performer. Yeah. And I also wonder it's gonna, if it's gonna take time to get your rhythm back. Uh, you know, to wait for that applause, or wait for, wait for that joke to register, and for people to to laugh or respond or cry or gasp or whatever it is, because that's part of the performance. Yeah. And if your timing isn't right, you step on that part of the performance. Um, do you, Do you have any kind of um, irrational fears about when you get back onto the stage about about your timing with an audience? No. Yeah. No. I, I feel like it's, um, if anything, I'll be better, hopefully. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like riding a bike and maybe um, starting it anew, like you forget any bad restrictive habits and you're just present, hopefully, and um, 
all of the wisdom or experience you have is just making it happen, which it sometimes has happened for me. I just feel like, wow, this show is happening by itself. I'm not even, you know, moving it, happening, making it happen. Let, let me press you on that because you said in the moment um, and try, try and articulate what that means to people who perhaps aren't on the stage um, because that is the ma- that's the secret sauce. And by the way, it's not every day as a performer that you're in the moment. Uh, but we, but you know when you are, yeah. and that's the dis- difference between a, a good performance and a great performance, or a great performance and a spectacular. It's, it's yeah. about about being in the moment. So, yeah. expand a bit more about what it is as a performer to be in the moment. Mm-hmm. So I think it's um, being very present and sensitive. So you're really listening and watching, and even beyond your senses, you're feeling. So you're feeling the, for you, the other musicians, you're feeling the music and the many ways it could be, right? Mm -hmm. Real minute um, nuances. And you're feeling the audience behind you, right? So I think it's about being honest and and a surrender and at the same time being like a super trained uh, pilot. So you've got all that experience and then you just, you don't even think about the rules anymore it's flowing through you which i think as a conductor you're doing anyway you you're not so much like strong arming them you're you're letting the music flow through you and they're taking their cues you're the center point that everybody you know vibing through on a really good night um and when i feel like i'm in the moment uh, i feel light and energetic but at uh, but in a split second there is thousands of uh, uh, opportunity for th- th- there's just a wealth of opportunity because mm-hmm. uh, we know how the music is going to go we know how the performance is supposed to go we've got the plan we've rehearsed it but there's also these moments when you can go off script and and you can create something that didn't happen in rehearsal yeah and that takes that performance up to the next level yeah. that is the magic uh, of performance for me yeah and you do that all the time um, there are a couple times. Uh, the first time you and I worked together when we were going uh, when we were touring around Iowa, um, and you you changed things up. And I remember one time, I I just totally broke it, broke character because you're just. So, I felt like I felt like Harvey Corman to your Tim Conway um, because I could just not stop laughing. Um, and I and I think the co- the comment was I can see your nose from here because you were on the floor looking up and I was yeah, like, yeah, right. I can see up and, your nose from here. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah. um, it's not that that was random. Yes, it was random, but you also took a risk at the moment because you had that energy going on in performance. You were in the moment. You yeah. you could steer the audience anywhere you wanted to at that moment. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, too, um, maybe... So as a, an improviser and a comedian, that's that's where you live right that's the jungle that you swing around in right um a a good friend of mine was was a really great improviser in toronto when i was living there and he said a good way to look at stuff is that everything is a gift so something happens wrong that's a gift what am i going to do with it right you know so the same thing as the flood happened what are we going to do let's take the orchestra on the road and do a comedy show with symphony music or Mm -hmm. or You know, so just thinking that way, it's almost like a Zen kind of way of thinking, like whatever is coming, (laughs) it's cool, whatever. (laughs) If somebody says you're lousy, you say, you're the only one that understands. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So you know what Aikido is? No. Martial art. So it's a martial art that was developed for um, women and children originally so that you um, you can use the energy of somebody much bigger than you. And the whole thing of it is like whatever their energy is going, you just guide them to the pavement. <laughs> Got it. I see. Yeah. And, and you do it in a you don't you don't do that, right? You you go whoa whoa right. whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> right? right. And and I think just thinking that way, hopefully, um, and trying to live that way. And I think you you're doing that as a musician. You're every little millisecond is something a little bit different that you're tweaking or playing with or right flowing with 
Um, you're the only. And I, I you... think too that some of your players too are more like uh, jazz, right? The the horn and yep. some of the trumpet player bass, for sure. Maybe. Yep, <laughs> principal trumpet Andy Clausen for sure. You yeah. know, you're you're the oh, <clears throat> you're the second artist. No, that's not true. Um, there's a handful of artists I've worked with here in Iowa, literally within five, um, that helped me give an extra dimension to the orchestra. Because I think you were talking about how improvisation is a gift. You know, when something goes wrong, it is a gift. Mm -hmm. And yet that is, that is the moment where classically trained musicians live in fear. Uh, yeah. Because they want certainty and they want, you know, th this, is, this is how it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and often we close ourselves to that opportunity. Yeah. And I uh, just had a, a, another guest recently, uh, Kevin Burt. Uh, we did a Christmas program with him, uh, uh, well, a, a year ago now. And, uh, you know, to find that nexus uh, where that, and that comfort zone where you, can, where you can push the orchestra to a moment into their uncomfortable zone. Um, and... Because and actually, in his case, a jazz musician or a blues musician who who doesn't read music, he was out of his comfort zone performing with all these classically trained musicians, and so yeah. we were all out of our comfort zone, and yet it worked beautifully. Yeah. Um, so long as you can make a safe environment for people to to, to make it okay, yeah. Because that's no, what it is. Nobody it, wants it to fail and look like an ass. Well, maybe yeah. you do, uh, but. Uh... <laughs> well, I, no, you're absolutely right about the safe environment. Yeah. When I was much younger, when I was like in my early twenties, I did I did like hundreds of school shows, mm -hmm. and I could always tell um, what the kids were going to be like depending on how the principal greeted me and interacted with me. Mm -hmm. If they were really gracious and sweet and hum had the humanity, the kids were flourishing and and in sync with the teachers. And if it was a real harsh kind of um, authoritarian thing the kids were cowering or you know what i mean yeah and it's the same thing in any organization i think so the they make, what, so if you made a sudden move did the kids like cower you know i mean just like not the quite power like of that, performance kid but less less natural in <laughs> less generous and less themselves of course yeah and i think that that's with any kind of leadership with the environment that is created um and you can, folks can read whatever they want into this. <laughs> um, but I would think too, the environment you create for your musicians is is going to dictate how free they feel to go out on a limb a bit, or try a little harder, or 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 you know to Perfor be to off me, balance to a little bit. To me, performance is all about risk, yeah, and being willing to take that risk, and so. This particular phrase, it could be either glorious or not. You know, uh, you know, if you, if you take that extra that extra effort, chances are your performance will go from something that's good to something that's electric. Yeah. Uh, there's sure there's there's a there, there's a chance of a wrong note or a clammed entrance or something like that. Yeah. But you always want that extra intensity for your audience. You know, because yeah. an audience can feel that. You, you know, you've had nights that you've been on and maybe not so on and and i'm not sure the audience would uh consciously know it but they at some yeah. level they they probably feel it yeah the difference between a good performance and when like you're taking those slight risks here and there to make it mm -hmm. even better do you know this woman uh ellen langer she's a professor um she she given a few talks about mindfulness and mm -hmm. about being in the moment and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And she's done different experiments. And one of them was she had an orchestra play the exact same piece twice right. and record it. And one time she said, just play it, you know, the way you're supposed to play it. And then the second time you and only you, each musician, find a note in there that you're going to attack a little bit differently. Right. And and then they played the recordings to a bunch of people, and everybody chose the one where there was that secret hidden thing. Had, had a little zing to it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And that's also the difference between groupthink and create and contributing to a, a project that's larger than yourself. Yeah. It's, that's, hey, like, hold that thought, because let's see what's going on in the chat room. Okay. Uh, by the way, you, you don't see this, by the way, Tom, Tomas, but as we've been speaking, uh, Ed has just been putting in. Uh, what was that one picture you just showed, Ed? Go back to that. Go back to that picture you just saw. Uh, what was it? 
Okay, there's about a 20 second delay. Um, yeah. Pat, uh, the great Pat has said, uh, I'm fascinated by the relationship between the symphony and the guest artist. How does the rehearsal process work once the artist uh, arrives and are all in the same space? Wow. Uh, Pat, that is a great question, um, and it depends on the person, but normally what happens when a guest artist appear, appro appears, uh, in a professional orchestra, an orchestra basically uh, rehearses maybe four times before a concert. And so when the artist arrives, they sit down with the, with the, comp with the conductor, and the, uh, and the conductor usually has a few different questions, like, some artists take time here. Do you take time here, or some? Do you want to go? Th they will tell you. Tell me, in terms of um, their performance concept, where they want to take time and where they want to barrel ahead. We'll talk about tempo. We'll talk about tricky spots where ensemble are, um, just so I kind of know what they're going to do. And then when we get into the rehearsal with the uh, with the orchestra, sometimes I don't have the the soloist play at first, especially if it's a tricky piece. But they usually come in, they, they play their part, and the orchestra is figuring their part out. And the musicians also hear their concept in real time. And so what I'm showing on the podium and what the, what the soloist is, is broadcasting in their own performance, the musicians are also saying, oh, that's how they're going to do this. Uh, okay, so we'll, they make a note in the music. Um, so basically, if the conductor and the soloist are... Um, on the same page, the rehearsals go very quickly. Um, there are times, uh, historically, for, for instance, when Glenn Gould performed with, uh, with uh, Leonard Bernstein and they hated each other, and he, to the point where Le Leonard Bernstein went on stage during the concert before the performance to disavow himself from the performance that was about to happen. Uh, that is not a good working relationship, and I can only imagine what an awful performance collectively that, that must have been. Um, but here's another thing, and, and Tomas, actually, you can actually um, chime in on this. What I have a hard time explaining to uh, a novice, uh, a young musician, even a, even a, even a, an accomplished musician, the really great performers uh, musically can telegraph what they're about to do um, just by the way they inflect. Uh, a particular phrase, uh, I can tell if they're about to slow down or speed up. They're sending signals to me all the time. And so when I hear that, I can prepare the orchestra because it takes a good two second lag time for the orchestra to, to follow along. Mm -hmm. But what I find what's really amazing about some of the great performers is that they, uh, they have this uncanny knack to communicate with me with their performance by their inflection and telegraph what they are about to do. Is there a similar analog in, in theater, in, in the, the work that you do when you are performing with a really great artist, uh, even though it may be, it, it, I don't know if it's scripted or even if it's um, uh, improvisation, that they're telegraphing where they're going with something? Yes. And I think it's, um, it's, it's almost like creating an ESP communication right yeah um and and i think you establish it from the beginning and it's it's like pavlovian it, like i i th i think one of my strengths is um connecting to an audience and and getting them into this magic space and and i do it through um little tiny increments that get really tiny um so I'll do something and they'll react and then I'll do something to their reaction and it becomes this really fine dance, right? And I think of it as, as being in, in a state of complicity or of, in a state of harmony. Um, so that you, like, have you ever seen dogs when they're play fighting together really fast or, or birds when they're just like totally, you know what I mean? So it happens in the springtime a lot. <laughs> yeah. And they're, so, they're so tuned in, right? They're right. really tuned in. There's no lag. It's like, you do this, I do that. So it's almost like that game where you do this and, and you, you try to whap the other person's fingers. So you're so sensitive and, and tuned in that you... I, I was going to tell you, too, I have a friend um, that Pat knows, too, who passed away a few years ago, who's an amazing um, 
lasso artist. He was like the world's greatest lariat guy. And I went horse riding with him. He had two big paint horses. And we were, we were talking and he said, you know, um, there's a saying that when you ride a horse, you borrow freedom. Oh, right? neat. I like that. And then we, we're, we're side by side and I wasn't, you know, I didn't have much experience on horses, but we got into this canter and then a gallop and it just felt like we're floating for about 20 seconds. The horse and us, you know, each of us had one of his horses and I, that's what I think it is, is to try to get to that place by listening and tuning in and communicating. Well, then let's add another layer of complexity and difficultness, uh, because sometimes you perform in Italian. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell me you can't speak Italian. I don't believe it. But uh, assuming, well, I, assuming, yeah. assuming that, uh, that, uh, that you can, or uh, assuming that you can't, and yeah. you're doing your performance in Italian, mm -hmm. so that, that, that removes an avenue of um, improvisation, at least verbally. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you extend that dance? when when yeah. you you can't get you literally cannot get off script yeah so um the thing is that there's there's different payoffs right so if you met somebody who was in uh cedar rapids who was from another country and they're trying to find something and they don't speak your language you're going to start like gesticulating looking at the map and then doing things you're going to speak in a much more base way it's not about the language or or we just leave them alone on the corner of the street <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the midwest yeah. <laughs> no i'm joking i'm joking yeah. you're absolutely right so so where you know where entire rooms are closed off you find other rooms yeah and you go wow i didn't know we could do this by candlelight right at, yeah you can open these windows whoa right yeah Right. So there's different ways of communicating. I've done shows where I don't speak at all, too, or in countries where I don't speak the language, or I have little cue cards, and it's almost it's almost dearer because you're hanging on to each other for dear life because they go, oh my god, this poor guy doesn't speak our language. They, there's almost a a more open-hearted uh, guest. You know, to, to, to host you well. So, so this also, this opens up another uh, window of w how to get the audience on your side. And I that's a perfect that, example. I mean, yeah. they're like, they, oh, they want to help you succeed. Yeah. And that's a part, of, that's an interesting part of performance as well. And, and there are musical analogs as well uh, about that. Yeah. So expand on that. Well, I think the audience wants you to succeed. They want a good show generally. They paid the money, yeah. right? They came to the thing. Right. Um, and so what you, I think, need to do as the artist or the performer is to um, let them believe or know that you are totally committed to, to giving them a magical experience. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't, or if they... Like, I remember years ago, too, I used to do a lot of stand-up comedy clubs. I do... Um, improv and comedy magic stuff and it was it was pretty um a pretty rough environment people would be drunk and if they sensed a weakness they would attack you or heckle you yeah so you had to be quite nimble and um you had to show them that you had the stuff and i imagine the same thing um if you're a guest conductor somewhere orchestras are you, are you orchestra gonna smell fear like a bloodhound yeah they yeah. make up their mind about you in the first 50 seconds yeah and yeah. so so it's it's a balance between uh being totally centered and being the uh the leader and being a benevolent ruler that they go i i feel good following this guy right yeah for sure yeah. let me go back to the chat room uh because we're running low on time yep uh let's see here I'm not seeing too much going on. Oh, <clears throat> Chuck wants Chuck wants to uh, wants you to sing the song at the campfire. <laughs> do, you, do you have your Do you have your ukulele handy there, sir? <laughs> I do, but I not that one. <laughs> oh my God, you you've got it handy. That's great. Make sure it's in oh. tune. Remember, I'm a music director and I'm critical. Oh, are you? No. You know, <laughs> 
I'm a conductor. I, well, I, I have um, such sweet memories, Tim, of our private kind of rehearsal moments. And I remember that first time I met you, I went to you guys were you guys were flooded out, so you were performing at that mega church. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yep. And then we went to a we went to a, a Japanese Chinese place in in Cedar Rapids, and then we kind of kept meeting that weekend. And then we went to a, an Indian place, and then I was saying goodbye to you, and I said, "I just I'm just worried. I hope I don't screw this whole project up." And you said, "Oh no, it's going to be freaking great." <laughs> Thank you for uh, actually uh, changing the word. That's not exactly what I said. Yeah, yeah. But it's close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that, was, that totally uh, created the environment for me to go, okay, I trust this guy and we can work together and I don't have to be afraid. No, no. You know? Um, actually, uh, Chuck actually um, just uh, interjected here because we're showing us all these great photos. Um, Kind of share briefly, what was the project? A little bit of the background of it. For those who are looking at these these pictures and going, what the hell is that? Yeah. I don't see what you're showing. Uh, it's basically you um, in performance and also in production of the um, uh, of our performance at Hancher uh, with Wycliffe. With Wycliffe. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's one... Um, there's one overhead one. I don't know if Ed showed that. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. So I would climb up there. I practiced a lot, but I came down on a rope to Ride of the Valkyries, as you might recall. Mm -hmm. And before that, you guys played, um, there, there's that video of the, the, the whole drowning of uh, Iowa City and the demise of the old Hancher. Yep. And I remember standing up there listening to you guys going, oh, my God, they've gotten really, really good. Yeah. Uh, hearing it up you know, up into that, uh, that spot there. Right. Yeah. And you know, so that was the, it, yeah. It, it's funny you say that because uh, like hot air, music kind of rises up. Um, and it's funny yeah. that you say that because you were right above the orchestra. Yeah. And about, I would say about 30% of the sound in most theaters doesn't actually make it out to the audience. It yeah. gets up into the rafters. And so you actually had the best seat in the house. Yeah. Uh, being and also, up. one of our earliest uh, meetings, too, with the orchestra when we were developing the project, I think you guys were rehearsing at uh, West High, was it? Probably. Yeah, it sounds about yeah. right. Yeah. And, and you were doing that, um, that cello piece that's Benjamin Britten, I think. Oh. That Jacqueline Dupre recorded. Oh no, no, that would have been. Oh, I know. That was. Uh, oh my God, that was a while back. That was the Elgar Cello Concerto. Yes, Elgar. great memory. That's right when I met you. Yeah. Yeah, and and I, you know, I was kind of like um, the tag along buddy, and I sat on your podium, and I was at the center of all that music, and it was just like ripping through me. It was, it was amazing to be that close and in the middle of all of those instruments and yeah. i thought nobody ever gets to stand here but the conductor to feel this that's true uh it is probably uh, the best uh occupational perk to have that yeah it was it was yeah. very emotional to feel that music so close yeah yep yeah, for sure so uh that was a project with hancher initially so that yeah. was sort of that was the the second version the original version was in the aftermath of the uh the flood of 2008 yeah. And we collaborated with Hancher, and we took the show on the road. We went all throughout Iowa, um, and, and just it was kind of like um, a lab experiment, if you will, to help develop this this idea of yeah. fusing your com your comedy with classical music. Yeah, yeah. And also, I I visited with you guys maybe a year and a half before we premiered it. You guys had a Valentine's gig at West High. Yep, yep. When you flooded out, and that was like. That was very valuable for me. I just did like a five minute spot as a guest. And that was really good. That was like getting an, an inoculation. Right. Because I thought, okay, I get the vibe now. Here's the feeling. The musicians are here. I have to make them laugh. The audience is here. And I, I got like a little taste of it. And then I knew, I knew more, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, with the, with the time remaining, um... Chuck Swanson is going to be my guest in a couple weeks. I can't remember exactly which week. Um, and I know that you were uh, planning to do something really spectacular uh, for August. Um, this past yeah. August, of course, was canceled because, uh, yeah. of, uh, because of the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, that project, because it must have been a real heartbreak to actually put that on ice for a while. 
Yeah, we'd been working on it for about three years, and it, it's a project called The Big Splash, and it's going to celebrate Hancher and uh, the, uh, the science lab down the river, which is part of the University of Iowa, the IIHR, um, which is a world-renowned science lab that has to deal with, with flow and currents and water and uh, all kinds of aspects of that. So we were going to do a big festival on the riverbank there, have the flying Walendas walk across a wire across the, the river and have a river parade with all these creative uh, magical floats and all kinds of on-site music and dance and stuff. And we've delayed it um, to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Hancher, which is going to be um, a year and a half from now. So it'll be August of 2022. Right. So it's still happening. We yeah. Just, but, but I, I, again, I, again, you know, a, a performance is the final sliver of a very long process because this was something that you were working on for at least two, maybe even three years. Because I remember you would come through town every once in a while and we'd sit down and have coffee and you'd yeah. tell me the latest of, of what's going on. So yeah. it's got to be heartbreaking when, you, when you've got this thing and all of a sudden um, the brakes are pulled on and it has nothing to do with you yeah. or anything else. It's just the reality of what we're all going through these days. Yeah. So you know the last thing. Um, stick around after when, uh, because I want to say goodbye after after we sign off to all our guests. But what is the one thing that you want audiences to know? What uh, what artists are going through this year? Um, whether it's the isolation, whether it's the you know what what is it that you would like your audience to know about about this year that audience that you as an artist are going through? Um, just that it's all going to come back and and um you know not not to give up a lot of people are suffering um not just by losing money or work but by the stress of all of this and the stress of these last few years you know not just this year mm -hmm. um just that spring will spring again yeah yeah and i like the fact that you um and i think you're right i think it's we all will come back better. We'll come back different. Uh, I, I don't yeah. think I, I don't think we'll be doing everything quite exactly the same way. Uh, yeah. For example, I just know I'll be doing a lot more of these, even when when we're back. Um, but um, I'm I'm hoping that artists and audiences will realize how important it is what we do. Uh, I think it's yeah. only times of national crisis that they say, "Oh, the arts—they're so important," and yet in the good times. Um, that's when cuts happening, cut, cuts happening, or, or people don't consider the arts quite so as important. Yeah. Yeah. But on, and, and from the artist's point of view, I hope that musicians and artists and actors realize how lucky we are yeah. uh, when we get back to the stage, and we will get back to the stage. Um, that uh, how fragile and how precious it is, precious it is that we get to do what we do. Yes. Um, and I think that can sometimes also be lost in the conversation. So I'd like to, to end this with, with that sort of uplifting uh, view on what the, what's happening in the Is pandemic. there a song you could break into, oh, Michael? Oh, no, you don't want it. Oh, no, you're the one who has to sing. Come on, sing us something, and as, as you're singing, Ed will take us out. So thanks for, for joining us. And by the way, everybody, next week, a good friend of mine, his name is Adam Flatt. He's a, he's a music director of the Tuscaloosa Symphony. He's going to be joining me this time next week. We're going to talk about the Crimson Tide and what it's like to live in a community with a winning football team. Are you ready? And no, no, no. I was just doing oh. that for dramatic effect. And if you really want to like reply to what I just said in a in a snarky sort of way, have at it. So we'll talk about music and the Crimson Tide. What's going on in Tuscaloosa? He's also the music director of the Denver Ballet, and so. Uh, but I also went to school with him, and he knows where the bodies are buried, and he can tell you all sorts of just dirt on me. So uh, join us next week. And with that, Tomas, take us away with something. There's a, a place for us. <laughs> a place for us. Peace and quiet and open air. Wait for us somewhere. <laughs> it's coming back. It'll come back. Yeah, 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 please cut the feed now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Right.